morning we're looking at a word that we hear a lot in Christmas songs, and that word is joy. When we think about the word joy, we think of songs like, O Holy Night, where the author says, A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. We think of, O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. We think of angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plain, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strain. And the songs we sang this morning, joyful, joyful we adore thee, and joy to the world, the Lord has come. Even when we open our Bibles to the book of Luke and we see the story of Christ's birth, we hear of joy. Luke chapter 1 and verse 14, Zechariah was told by the angel, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Luke chapter 1 and verse 44, John the Baptist leaped for joy in his mother's womb. Luke 1 47, Mary rejoiced in God her Savior. 1 58, they were rejoicing with Elizabeth And as we have already read, Luke 2 and verse 10, the angel proclaimed glad tidings of great joy. Let me ask you this morning, are we joyful? Are you joyful? When was the last time you really could say that you were filled with joy? Now, now I want you to recognize that I did not ask you, (laughs) when was the last time you were happy? Because there is a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based on temporary experiences and circumstances where joy goes deeper than that. Joy comes from the very core of who we are and what Christ has done. And despite what anyone tells you, or even what you try to tell yourself, everyone wants to live a joyous life. Nobody sets out with the goal of becoming jaded and bitter. There's not a child in the world who's thinking to himself, well, I hope I live long enough to be a cranky old man. I don't think there's any child that that wishes for that. And those who eventually get there, those who are at a point in their life that they don't even want joy, who prefer misery, they're broken. Bitterness has taken root. Tragedy has derailed them and disappointment has hardened them. In the text that was read this morning, this beautiful prophecy that Curtis read comes right after we hear a story of how hardened the Israelites had become. In chapter 8 of Isaiah, beginning in verse 19, it says, When they say to you, Consult the mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into utter darkness. That's a pretty ugly picture. That's a pretty depressing way to start a sermon on joy. But the point of it is this. As dark as things are at the end of Isaiah 8, Isaiah 9 promises that joy is coming. And beginning in verse 1, it says, but, I I love that. Chapter 8 ends with darkness. But chapter 9 begins with, but, 
there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in, walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. And with the gladness of the harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. God is speaking in, in future tense to their present situation. And he says to these people that, that he will replace their gloom with honor. He will replace darkness with light. And he will replace sadness with joy. God is promising joy. There is a promise of joy. People in both the southern and northern kingdoms were facing hopeless situations. Political unrest, constant threat of war, those were persistent problems. Sickness was rampant. Hug hunger was an ever-present reality. They were hopeless. And we have seen hopelessness and despair even this year in our world. In the aftermaths of hurricanes Harvey and Irma and Maria, we have witnessed the pain and suffering caused by the earthquake in Mexico and the wildfires that are happening even as we speak in California. And most likely, each and every one of us have experienced personal situations that temporarily, hopefully, only, have caused us to lose our joy. For many, they're still recovering from the economic downturn of 10 years ago. That's not that distant. Many of you remember the loss of jobs and home foreclosures and the upheaval of those times. But Isaiah chapter 9 is still a valid promise. It's a promise that God will replace gloom with honor. He will replace darkness with light. And he will replace sadness with joy. Now where does this joy come from? What's the source of this joy? Well, the prophet Isaiah foresees great things happening for the people. And in verse 4, he says this, For ye shall break the yoke of their burden." And the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors, as it is at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult, and the cloak rolled in blood will be burning fuel for the fire. It almost seems like he's talking about an end to conflict and war. But what's more important for us to understand this morning is for all these promises that God made, what is the source of those promises? The source of those promises begins in verse 6, where it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of His government or His peace on the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The source of joy is not external circumstances. The source of joy is not how much you get paid each week. The source of joy is not a present wrapped under a tree. The source of joy is Jesus. Emmanuel. God with us. This very word, Emmanuel, means that God will not leave or forsake His people. It is a watchword among us, a word that brings glad tidings of great joy. 
No matter how desperate times get, no matter how desperate circumstances become, we know that our God is with us. It doesn't matter if it's unemployment or death or divorce or bankruptcy or poverty or illness or surgery or pain or hurt or national, nat natural disasters or, or terrorist attacks. It doesn't matter. Emmanuel means that God is with us even in those situations. It means that God surrounds us with his love. That he bathes us with his spirit. Even in those situations, we are never left in our own pain or hate or anger or fear or hurt because our God is with us. These thoughts caused Paul to write in Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is why we call him wonderful. That is why we call him counselor. That is why we call him everlasting father. And that is why we call him the prince of peace. Now, I want to call your attention to one phrase. It's a phrase that I really don't think I've ever spent much time pondering until it kind of jumped off the page at me this week as I was preparing for the sermon. Matter of fact, at this point in the sermon, I was planning on going a completely different direction. But then all of a sudden I saw this. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. And I got to thinking about that. And, and, and I got to really wondering about this word zeal. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. So I, I began to study it and look it up and, and wanted to see it in the Old Testament. Well, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is kinal. Kinal, which literally means, you ready for this? Jealousy. Jealousy. And, and not jealousy maybe in the way we would think of jealousy. You know, you get jealous if you see your, you know, your, your girlfriend or your wife talking to a good-looking guy in the store. Not, not that kind of jealousy. Not that kind of jealousy. It's a jealousy that incorporates passion. It's, it's an intense type of love. It's like in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14 where it says God is a jealous God. He's not jealous in the sense that we often define that word. He is a passionate God. So thinking about all that, what is it that God's jealously passionate about? You. You. Us. He is jealously passionate passionate about you. God is crazy about you. Church, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he listens. He could have chosen to live anywhere in this world, but he chose your heart. God is crazy about you. And how do we even respond to that? Well, the psalmist responded in Psalm 90 and verse 14 by saying, Satisfy me in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing joy and be glad all of our days. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Do you know who wrote that? I'm going to give you a hint. Usually when we say the psalmist wrote, we automatically think David. David did not write this. Now the person who wrote this was a shepherd, but he was not only a shepherd of sheep, 
but of people. Stubborn people who, because of their lack of faith, caused him to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and never see the promised land. Yet after everything he went through, Moses still sang for joy and was glad. Were his circumstances good? <laughs> no. Think he got tired of that manna in the wilderness? Yeah. You think the people around him kind of drove him nuts? Probably. But he still sang for joy and was glad. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I know what some of you are going through. But I don't know what all of you are going through. And, and, and I want to go back and I want to ask you, how's your joy? When you sang those songs this morning, was it grudgingly and of necessity? <laughs> or were you joyful? And, and maybe the better question is, is how can we begin to experience this increased joy that God has promised us? Promised us? Well, I want to give you three quick hints of advice, if you will. And then this lesson will be yours today. Short and to the point. Number one, don't confuse happiness with joy. Don't do it. Happiness can come from many sources, even evil sources. You can be happy while doing bad things. Amen. But that's temporary. Joy only comes from God. Number two, if you want to experience increased joy, be an instrument of God's joy. Isaiah said that Jesus came to replace darkness with light. Well, unless we've forgotten, you are that light. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me tell you, when that happens... That brings about joy and enthusiasm and excitement in your life. And number three, recognize that you are worth it to God. Now, now I really want you to hear this point this morning. Because I think sometimes the reason that we don't feel the joy in our heart the way we should is we suffer with the Eeyore syndrome. I'm no good. Everybody doesn't like me. I don't know why God would ever do anything for me. We have this negative outlook upon ourselves and we begin to wonder, man, I don't even know why God would love me. Joy comes when we recognize that you are worth it to God. His passion for you is greater than anything you have done or anything you have been through. I mean, Israel kept turning their back on God. They kept letting other things distract them from serving and honoring Him. They had spiritual ADD. I mean, they'd be like, God, we love you. God, we worship you. God, we praise you. Ooh, shiny thing. And they'd go off another direction. Over and over and over again, they turned their back on God, but they were worth it to Him. They had been through famine and natural disaster and war and idol worship. But they were worth it to God. His passion and His zeal still sought to save them. And I'm telling you again, no matter what, you are worth it to God. Now, I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm talking to you. No matter what, you are worth it to God. He is still your wonderful counselor, mighty God everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. The fact is, we all face difficulties in life. Challenges in work or at school. 
people that are hard to get along with. There's stress, there's problems, there's disappointments. And if we're not careful, we let the pressures of this life weigh us down. It's easy to complain. It's easy to become negative and discouraged. But we were not meant to go through this life with our heads down. We were not meant to go through this life with a frown on our face. We were created to enjoy this life. We were. I didn't say we were created to be happy. I said we were created to be a people of joy. Because we can't control what happens on the outside. But we can control what happens on the inside. You can control how you react to the people around you. You can control how you react to things that happen around you. You can control what happens on the inside. You see, happiness is fleeting. Happiness for a lot of people depends on what happens to them. It's the weekend, so I'm happy. Winter break is coming and I'll be out of school for two and a half weeks, so I'll be happy. My favorite team won a football game, which didn't happen very much this year, so I'm happy. Work wasn't too stressful today, so I'm happy. My wife didn't ask me to pick up my dirty socks tonight, so I'm happy. That's just temporary. That goes away. But the joy that comes from knowing Christ doesn't come and go from what happens around you. The joy from knowing Christ comes and stays because of what happens inside you. It comes from knowing that no matter what, you are worth it to God. And this morning, if your joy has been kind of in and out of flux, then that's not joy, that's, that's temporary happiness. If your joy is not what it's supposed to be, that's not God's fault. He has given you everything you need for joy. He's given you Jesus. He's given you his wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace. This morning, I want to encourage you, if you are not a Christian, to accept Jesus' invitation to live a life of joy, not only here on this earth, but in eternity with him in heaven. And if you are a Christian, but you've been suffering with that Eeyore syndrome, you've been walking down, around with your head down, would you please, for the love of God, lift up your head and remember that you are worth it to him. Because when you do that, the light that Isaiah talked about in Isaiah chapter 9... The light that penetrates darkness. When you do that, you become that light. If we can help you in any way this morning, won't you come while we stand?